This video continues our epic investigation into induction and today we're going back to question 6 from the 1988 Math Olympiad. It's pretty legendary, we've discussed it on the channel before on more than one occasion. But Zvezda was one of the few people who as a student managed to crack it and she used, you guessed it, induction. One of the iconic problems from the International Math Olympiad, Australia 88. Brady, you have done videos on it, but I was there as a student, I solved the problem, and my teammate, Emanuel Atanasov, he got the Brilliancy Award for his solution. My solution involved induction and the cubic um, polynomial. His solution involved induction in a quadratic polynomial. So it was simpler and we will talk about Emmanuel's solution now. So we're going to look at the way that he did it, not the way you did it. Yes, mine was pretty close. It had this extra linear factor, which I don't know how I concocted, but it was there and it's a perfectly legal solution. But to this day, I remember Emmanuel's solution. Were you jealous afterwards when you found out that the two of you did it differently and his won the brilliancy prize? Did you think, oh, I wish I'd done it that? Or were you still happy? You know, never. I remember talking with Emmanuel about vaguely similar problems before the Olympiad. And uh, he was asking me some question about them. So he must have understood something I told him better than I understood it myself. And um, actually for me, it took only 20 minutes to solve this problem. Again, I had never seen something exactly like this before. I don't know what overcame me. And number theory was never my forte. I love, for example, geometry, algebra, but number theory. And all of a sudden you get this moment in your life where 20 minutes defines your future because after the Olympiad, a year later, I came to the United States on a scholarship. How was I selected among thousands of students from Sofia University on only seven scholarships for Bulgarian students to come to the United States? The Australian committee wrote a recommendation letter for me. And they said that was the only girl who solved this iconic problem, take her. And here I am standing in front of you and looking back and understanding that was the moment of no return. This is what brought me to the United States. We were super happy for Emmanuel to get the Brilliancy Award. In fact, lots of Brilliancy Awards have gotten to Bulgarian students. So that wasn't a total surprise. What's the question? Yes, yeah, so you start with two numbers which are stubbornly given to you as natural numbers and you will see why I call stubbornly. You are also given that the following ratio a squared plus b squared over 1 plus ab and I'm going to call it r for ratio happens to be an integer. Well, okay, it must be a natural number because these are natural numbers here. Okay, what do we have to show? Prove that this ratio R is a perfect square. So what does a perfect square mean? It means that it's something like one squared or two squared or three squared, etc., etc., and squared for some natural number N. So for instance, you cannot get here for r, um, I don't know, 7 fourths, because that's not an integer, and in fact, we're not even interested in this. But more than that, you cannot get 7, because 7 is not a perfect square. So our job is to explain why you cannot get 7, why it has to be a perfect square. And how old were you when you were sat down and had to answer this question, or prove this? I think uh, I was 18. Now, what we're going to do is something non-trivial. We have two variables here, a and b. r isn't given by the problem as variable, I just put it there. But it turns out that it's r that is going to give us an anchor for solving the problem. While a and b are going to vary throughout our solution, r is going to be fixed. And that's an unexpected twist. So we're going to fix 
this ratio r, and then we will simplify the pairs a, b that give the same ratio r. So if I start with one pair that is given to me, I will somehow reduce it to a very, very simple pair. Let me not give away how simple that will be. That will again give exactly the same ratio r. And the conclusion will immediately follow. Okay, what are the ground rules here? The new numbers a n and b n that we find, those pairs, so let me just once again emphasize they have to give the same ratio. So if I plug them into this formula, I should get the same R. Those numbers, I'm going to allow them to be non-negative integers. So not just natural numbers from 1, 2, and so on, but I'm going to add a zero to that. Because this is my creation, I can do whatever I like, I'm the boss, so a n and b n will be possibly zeros. They will still be integers. And to cut this abstraction and make it very specific, I'm just going to give you an example. Suppose I say my ratio is 4. 4 is good. 4 is 2 squared. So this should work. And what number C and B could I take? Let's say I take A should be 30 and B 112. All right, so this is just an example. Let us see if this works. So we plug this in. Oh my goodness, look at this huge number. You can check me at home. And what do you think this ratio is? I think it's four. Let's check that. Four times one is four, two, yeah, yeah, okay, this works. Okay. All right, so that's our starting pair. I want to simplify. How can I do this? So now take your original fraction here and rewrite it differently. Next, I'm going to pull everything to the left hand side, but I will start regrouping things. Let me see if you can follow this. R times AB is right here, pull to the other side. And then the remainder is B squared minus R. And this whole thing has to be zero. Now, if I write it like this, this looks like a quadratic equation. And so I will replace a by an unknown x, but leave absolutely everything else the same. And so what this equation is, is quadratic. So it will have two roots, x1 and x2. Now, x1, we already know, at least one of them has to be a. A satisfies this equation. And so there is another root, x2, which um, let's call it a1. So there is this phantom second root of this equation. Uh-huh. What kind of a number is a1? I would really like it to be a non-negative integer so it can fit into my scheme. Well, I can immediately say that it's an integer. Why? Because Vieta's formulas tell you that if you add the two roots of your quadratic equation, you'd better get a negative of this coefficient, which turns out to be Rb. And from here, x2, this other phantom root, is an integer. Because everything involved here is already an integer. Could this x2 be negative? I don't want that. Well, one easy way to show that it's non-negative is to go back to the original ratio and plug it in. Now, after you backtrack everything, you can replace everywhere a by x, by x2. So x2 should work here too. So in other words, if I do x2 squared plus b squared over 1 plus bx2, that should be our original r. This is supposed to be non-negative, in fact, positive. This is our 4. Well, the top is positive, so the bottom has to be positive. But could x2 actually be negative here? Because b is already positive. x2 is an integer. If I start subtracting integers from 1, things will go sour because I could hit 0, which I don't want in the denominator, or I could get negative altogether in the denominator. But the whole ratio is positive. So there is no way this x2 could be negative. At worst, it could be zero. All right. So x2 is not just an integer. It's a non-negative integer. So this, this phantom twin is good for us. And so let's try to find it in our situation. 30 here 
is our A and 112 is B. So what was the formula for X2? There is the formula. So X2 will be RB minus X1, which in our case R is 4, B is 112, and X1 is A, which is 30. All right, but what is that, guys? This is, doesn't look good. This looks more complicated. It looks larger, right? It looks something like uh, 418. So what I have obtained is that the pair 418 instead of A, and I'm going to keep B, will also yield this ratio 4. But instead of simplifying my problem, I actually complicated it. I got larger numbers. So what am I going to do? Who said that I have to tackle A? How about we try to replace B? I mean, if you look at this pair, it's more reasonable to try to reduce the larger of the two numbers, 112. But absolutely the same analysis that we did for A works for B. So if I uh, rewrite this equation as B squared minus RAB plus, so I'm just flip-flopping A and B, and now B is going to be my unknown, as I will call it just Y, and now I have two roots. One of them is B, and the other one, let's call it B1. So what is B1 in this case? We will have, again, Vieta's formulas. But mind it, this time I'm getting RA, not RB. So this phantom second root is RA minus Y1. So RA minus your B. Uh-huh. Will that save the day? So now we're going to hope we can simplify this 112. All right, well, right here, what do we have? Y2 will be, remember, R is 4. What is A? A is 30. B is 112. Oh, this looks hopeful. 120 minus 112, that's 8. 8 is better than 112. So what I have just produced for you is another pair, 30, 8 that also gives this ratio. Now, I, I'm sure at this point you guys don't believe me. Let's quickly compute 30 squared plus 8 squared over 1 plus 30 times 8. All right, what's that? Uh, 964 divided by 241. Is this 4? Yep, it is 4. So this pair gives exactly the same ratio as the other two pairs. Uh, now I feel better. So what am I going to do? We can see that we could reduce the larger number down. So can't we now reduce 30 down? Let's try. And I know the formula for reducing the A's. It was our first derived one. So if I want to find now the twin to 30, I'm going to do four times, my B is 8, so 4 times 8, minus, and X1 is 30. Oh, this looks splendid. It's 2. We are getting there, Brady, we are almost there. There we go. So what is the new pair? Instead of 30, we put 2. B survives, no change. And again, you are doubting me. Does this give the same 4? Of course. 2 squared plus 8 squared over 1 plus 2 times 8. What's this? 68 over 17. Bingo. That's 4. So which of the two numbers should I now reduce? 2 or 8? 8. 8, of course 8. And for 8, it's that formula here. So what do we do? We do Y2 is 4 times... A is 2 minus 8 for Y1. What is that? That is 0. And that's why actually the problem works, because you get to this forbidden 0. The creators of the problem deliberately didn't give you the possibility of plugging in 0 here. They said that A and B have to be natural numbers. But we go beyond 
what they gave us, and we create our own world of solutions, slightly extended. So what am I talking about here? This 2A turns into two stays, and 8 becomes 0. Does this give our 4? And here I doubt anyone will have any doubts. There is nothing to come from here, and I'm dividing by 1, so the only thing that's left is 2 squared, which is our 4, but 2 squared was our original a squared. That's really the reason we are getting perfect squares. Because once you start with any pair of numbers that work for the problem, you will reduce it one by one until you get to a pair that contains a zero. And then you wave the victory flag. What was it? The checkered flag? Something. You, Brady, you fill me in on... on it's checkered flag. Yeah. The checkered flag. Yeah. That's right. Now, where is induction in this? I don't see infinitely many steps here. These were finitely many. But I don't know what the initial pair is. I cannot just argue by this example. It starts somewhere, and I need the general reasoning to show me that this process actually works, brings you to a pair that has a zero in it. And it doesn't go on forever. Here, I actually want it to stop. So this induction will be finite induction. You have only finitely many dominoes. And that stops the process. The moment one of our numbers turns into zero, we stop the car and say, we are there. We have arrived. I need another sheet of paper. OK. So just so I'm clear, mm -hmm. the ra so the ratio is not always 4. No. The no. ratio will be the square of whatever yes, the first Yes, that's number. right. Yeah. This was just for our example so we can clearly see concretely how this is working before we get to the variables. So now the proof. What we just did was a particular example. I agree, very convincing one. But we need to wrap this in a technical package so that it fits in our vehicle of induction. It is the inductive step here that needs to be confirmed that it actually is always works for any variables, not just for our particular numbers. Here is our ratio, and I'm going to fix it as r. r is some integer, positive integer. a and b are natural numbers. And uh, what we did is we rewrote this as an equation that equation was quadratic, like this. Then we replaced a by x, and we created two roots, one of which was a, and the other one, by the ETAS formulas, turned out to be rb minus the other root, or rb minus a. And then we did exactly the same thing with a and b switch. So instead of x, I am using y. And now we create two roots here. One of them is b, the other one is ra minus the previous root, or ra minus b. Okay, so now what do we do? We start with a pair AB that yields this ratio R. I'm going to conjecture, not conjecture, but assume for a moment by contradiction that our method fails. It means that if I attempt to replace A by its twin root, A2, but keep B, I'm going to be enlarging. In other words, A2, will be bigger than A. And at the same time, if I keep A but replace B by its twin, I'm again increasing, or even equal. So in other words, I'm not doing anything. So assume for a moment that this is what's happening. We don't want this to happen. We want actually to go down, not to go up. OK, where is our contradiction? Let us go back into the ETAS formulas. And they said that the sum of the two roots, x1 plus x2, is Rb. And the sum of the other two roots is Ra. One of those roots here, let's say x1, that was A. And one of those two roots is B, so B plus Y2. So uh, what uh, have we done here? 
We have just written VETAS formulas, but those are just one part of VETAS formulas. There is a second VETAS formulas, which concerns the products of those two roots. So what is the product of the roots of a quadratic equation? It is the last coefficient over the first one, but here the first one is one. So this is going to be equal to b squared minus r. And similarly, for the other quadratic equation, the two roots should multiply to a squared minus r. Again, this is Vieta's formulas. Okay, now I'm gonna continue. x1 was a, and then we got x2. y1 was b, and we got y2. Okay, we are almost there. What did we assume about x2? x2 was this a2. We assumed that x2 was greater than or equal to a. And everything is positive, so this is greater than a times a, which is a squared. And we did exactly the same thing for b. That was y2 was b2. That is b greater than or equal to b times b, b squared. The problem is that I have on the left-hand side something that's actually smaller than what's on the right-hand side, but I, I'm claiming exactly the opposite, because if I add everything, what will I get? a squared plus b squared minus 2r on the left is greater than or equal to a squared plus b squared. And that is not going to happen because that means that 0 is greater than or equal to 2r or r is negative, but that's in contradiction with what's given. We avoided ruining our proof. We actually showed that it works. So with our pair AB, we cannot be going upstairs. At least one of these two pairs must be smaller. And you can prove for homework that actually exactly one pair will be smaller and the other one would be larger. And when I say smaller, I don't mean that the numbers, both of the numbers are smaller, that one of the numbers is smaller and the other one is fixed. And that's all we need. And so with this proof at hand, you will start creating a chain of pairs, each of which gives r. And the numbers inside now could potentially be zero because of our formulas, Vieta's formulas, but that's okay. The only thing that they cannot be is negative. And so you will keep on going. What does it mean keep on going? It means I'm using induction. So keep on applying this algorithm until one of the numbers becomes zero. And I don't know ahead of time which one it will be whether a or b will turn into zero. But the important thing is that the ratio is kept the same. And so far I haven't said anything about the ratio, at least on this brown paper, but we are ready to show that the ratio is a perfect square because if I plug in any one of those two pairs into our expression, this is what we get. In actuality, you're not going to have both of them. You're going to have just one of them. But I'm writing them for completeness here. And this is going to be R. So R is going to be equal either to B n squared or A n squared, which is a perfect square. And now we are truly done after finitely many steps. For homework, you can actually compute what is the largest number of steps you can ever have. Another homework. Brady, do they give them homework? No, them? I don't. I, I want to know what the number is. Because I love numbers on number file. <laughs> Will you whisper it in my ear later? Because, or is it, is it like a fine? Well, is it, it a, depends. It depends. So it could be very. It, yeah, if, if those numbers A and B are large, you can go many steps. But um, as you saw in our original example, at the very end, we were going very fast. At any rate, what I wanted also to say is that you can go backwards. You can start with any pair of numbers, one of them zero, so 0b zero or a0, zero, and backtrack with Vieta's formulas, those guys here, ra minus b, rb minus a, backtrack and create recursive formulas for all of those pairs that actually satisfy this problem. 
uh, and you know investigate and study them. But for our purposes for, for solving this problem at the Olympiad, what we cared is that we hit a wall. We hit this zero for one or the other variable and that's where we put a full stop to the induction. You were basically kids. This is amazing. <laughs> Aspiring like... to be adults yeah. <laughs> at that point. Yes, yes. Apparently, Terence Tower, who is like, you know, the most famous mathematician in the world, he was also at this Olympiad and he didn't get it. He couldn't do it. He wasn't just at the Olympiad. He was actually in my room. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so all of the participants in the IMO were split into several rooms and I may have been even the only girl in my room, I don't remember, but when I looked around it looked like only boys. I had slept really poorly the night beforehand, I basically didn't sleep. I was so tired, I knew that if I don't solve the problems very quickly, I'm just not going to survive the test. And they give you four and a half hours for three problems every day. So this is day two. And our problem that we discussed was number six. So one of the three problems. I was ready in about an hour and 20 minutes done with all three problems. I don't know what possessed me. I had never done this before. I attempted to give my papers and go and sleep because I was so tired. They told me for security reasons, you cannot leave. Okay, so then I returned to my chair and I fell asleep. I actually slept for probably about two hours, which was very nasty of me because some of the boys around me knew me from the previous Olympiad in Cuba, so they knew that I would not fall asleep unless I had solved all the problems. But I couldn't help it, I was just out. And so then I wake up, look around, everyone is still continuing to solve the problems. And then again, I attempt to leave about an hour early. So finally, they let me go. And on walking outside, my coaches saw me and they were angry. Zvezda, why did you leave early? Well, if they had known how early I could have left. Later on that day, as I'm walking, someone is pulling me you know, by my skirt, she's pulling my skirt. And I look down and it's this star participant, an Australian representative, Terence Tao. Because he, he, he was very young. Oh, he was super young, yeah. So at any rate, he was in my room. He obviously remembered what happened. He witnessed all of this. And so he's pulling my skirt and saying, how did you solve number six? And I start saying, I used induction on the product. He says, thank you, turns around and runs away. Amazing. So the word induction <laughs> on the product, that expression was enough for him to go and complete the rest of the solution. Actually, I don't know if he completed it, but at least that he did not want any more hints. That was it for Terence. If you'd like to hear Terence tell himself talking about question six, check out our interview with him here on Number File. And we haven't quite finished with induction yet. We've got another video on our Number File 2 channel. There will be a link on the screen and in the video description. Okay, the question, yes. What, what, what's your recollection of it now and why? And you, you didn't get it right. No, I did not get it right. How uh, do you feel about that? I, uh, well, you know, you, you win some, you lose some. Uh, I, oh boy. I, uh, I have, so, so long ago now, I don't remember much about it. 